Now, when Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus was making and baptizing more disciples than John, although Jesus himself did not baptize but only his disciples, he left Judea and departed again for Galilee. And he had to pass through Samaria. So he came to a town of Samaria called Sychar near the field that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, so Jesus, Jesus, wearied. Jesus, wearied as he was from his journey, was sitting beside the well. It was about the sixth hour. A woman from Samaria came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Give me a drink, for disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a woman of Samaria? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, if you knew, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, sir, you have nothing to draw water with. And the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob? He gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did his sons and his livestock. Jesus said to her, everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. And the woman said to him, sir, I give, sir, give me this water so that I will not be thirsty or have to come here to draw water. The word of the Lord is blessed. Amen. Would you look again to verse number 10? Jesus answered her, if you knew. I want to title our time together, if we only knew. (laughs) If we only knew. Can you turn to your neighbor? I'll try not to tell you to turn to your neighbor the rest of the time. But could you turn to your neighbor and say, if you only knew. (laughs) (laughs) If we only knew how close our world was to a nuclear disaster on September 26, 1983, maybe the man who diverted not only World War III, but probably the disaster and the obliteration of planet Earth, we probably would celebrate him more than we have. This man would eventually have a movie made after him that was titled The Man Who Saved the World. Anybody ever heard of that movie before? (laughs) Come on, Doc. You know that'll preach by itself right there. But while this man was alive, he went underappreciated. So underappreciated that his death went nearly four months before it was reported or recognized. He had been dead four months before they reported that he had died. He died in May of 2017, and they didn't report it, news outlets, media outlets didn't report it until September of 2017. His name is Stanislav Petrov. We're just going to call him Petrov because he has a funny name. It's funny for us in America. Petrov was a lieutenant colonel in the Soviet Union's air defense forces. His job for Russia's air defense force was to monitor his country's satellite system. His job was to look at the computer for any possible nuclear weapons that were launched by the United States. Back in the 80s during the Cold War, you all know how significant this was. And so on the fateful morning of September the 26th, 1983, towards the end of his overnight shift, he was monitoring the satellite systems on the computer and the computer sounded an alarm. The alarm indicated that the U.S. had launched five nuclear-armed intercontinental continental ballistic missiles towards Russia. Five. The siren howled, he said. But I just sat there for a few seconds staring at that big backlit red screen. And the screen read, launch on it. And all he had to do was pick up the phone and call his superiors to tell them that they were under attack by the U.S. and that the Russia needed to now strike back with nuclear missiles as well. 
the U.S. missiles could reach the Soviet Union in just over 20 minutes. So he didn't have any time to spare, but he sat there in silence. He sat there knowing that every second of procrastination would take away valuable time that the Soviet Union's military and political leadership needed to decide whether or not to begin nuclear warfare that would probably take out planet Earth. All he had to do, he says, was to reach for the phone, raise the direct line to their top commanders, but in that moment, he could not move. He said, it felt like I was sitting on a hot frying pan. He did not move. He was silent, even though all the indicators on the screen said that he should sound the alarm and that he should get up out of his seat and do something. Although he had been trained to expect an all-out nuclear assault from the U.S., something did not seem right that day. Something wasn't adding up. It seemed strange that the satellite system was only detecting five missiles. That was just a few missiles being launched instead of a whole bunch of missiles. And so he had been trained that the U.S., if they were going to attack Russia, would send an assault of missiles, just not a few. And so he knew that the computer satellite monitoring system that they were using was fairly new, but he didn't completely trust it. And so instead of responding to the indicators that the nuclear missiles were headed to Russia, he sat silent. 23 minutes later, he said, I realized that nothing had happened because <laughs> he was still alive. And had there been a real strike, he would have already known about it. And so he was in such relief. It turned out that Petrov was correct and that the computer satellite monitoring system was malfunctioning. It was responding to sunlight that was bouncing off of the satellite's image. The man who saved the world would not receive many accolades when he was alive. Not until the end of his life did people even begin to go and interview him. And his death went unnoticed, unnoticed. But his silence to the ind indicators potentially saved our world from destruction. And while I'm grateful that Mr. Petrov was level-headed enough to stay silent when he looked at the indicators on the computer satellite monitoring system, I'm puzzled. I'm puzzled because many of us, although some of y'all did get the clue this week, many of us come to church on Sunday mornings, and it seems like we're responding to the indicators of our life like Mr. Petrov did when he looked at the screen. Indicators in our life that is clear that God has been good to us. They are flashing off to us that God has been faithful to us. In fact, if you did not know, his mercies were new this morning for us. And the indicators are going off. They are blaring for us that God is a good God and he is a faithful God. And while that should be enough to cause us to get out of our seat, to ascribe praise and worship to the Lord, we are calculated in how much worship we want to give to the Lord. We are reserved in how much we want to engage our entire being to ascribe praise to our Lord and Savior. Is it just me or anybody else puzzled out there? Perhaps you're thinking, well, um, I don't know if God's been good to me. And if the fact that he woke you up this morning is not enough, and if the fact that he put breath in your lungs is not enough, if the fact that you had a roof over your head, if that's not enough, if the fact that you actually had clothes to put on, and like the old folks used to say, if the fact that you woke up and you were in your right mind, if that's not enough, can I let you know that all of creation is blaring the signal of God's goodness? Do you know that? The 19th Psalm, verse 1, says this, The heavens declare the glory of God. 
The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day, they listen, they pour forth speech. Night after night, they reveal knowledge. Hear this. They have no speech and they have no words and no sound is heard from them. Yet, their voice goes out into all the earth and their world words to the ends of the world. Sometimes all you got to do is just look up. And you'll see there are indicators all around declaring God's goodness and declaring God's sovereignty and declaring that he still has the whole world in control. That's all right. I don't mind preaching this morning if you're going to make me preach. But I'll give you another passage because in Romans chapter 1, verse 20, it tells us this, that since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature, they have been clearly seen being understood from what has been made so that people are without excuse. We are without excuse. Last time I checked, even the winds and the seas obey his voice. And so since we're without excuse, I'm compelled to ask you this week again, will we worship? Will we truly worship? I keep telling you this, we all worship something. Tim Keller's words ring to me again. If God is not at the center of your life, something else is. And so if we're worshiping anything other than God, that is not true worship. You will worship something. But if you worship anything or anyone other than God, That is not true worship. But the hour is now here, as the passage tells us. In verse number 23 of chapter 4, the hour is now here when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship him. So, will we be true worshipers? Will we worship? Augustine, one of the early church fathers, said it this way, if Christ is not valued at all, excuse me, Christ is not valued at all unless he is valued above all. If Christ is not valued in your life above everything else, Christ is not valued at all. And this is what this John 4 passage ascends and builds towards. It is a pathway towards true worship. It climaxes there in verse number 23, saying that the Father is seeking people who will worship him in spirit and in truth. And so I invite you to continue down this pathway to true worship with me. In the opening verses of this account, we we encounter Jesus before he even encounters this woman at the well. And last week, we looked at how we are presented with Jesus. He is a man who is compelling, but he is also a man who compels us to worship. Amen? So in these next nine verses, verses 7 through 15, we see Jesus also in these verses patiently uncovering for this woman. He's uncovering a gift that is so great that if she only knew If she only knew of this gift, not only would it change her life, but it would also drastically change the way that she responded to Jesus. If she only knew who it was that was sitting in front of her, if she only knew the gift of God, not only would it drastically change her life, but it would change the way she responded to the person who was in front of her. Jesus is like saying this to her. He's like, do you have any idea who it is that you have just encountered? You don't even know. Because if you only knew, you wouldn't be responding the way that you are. If you only knew who it was, you would be jumping out of your skin and worshiping me because of who it is that is standing in front of you. If you only knew, It would change your life, but it would also change your response to the one that is standing in front of you. And I believe that that's a word for many of us in this room this morning. If we only knew, 
our response would be different. If we only knew, we wouldn't give God a calculated worship, but we would give him everything unhindered with all of our heart. I think it's remarkable and it is worth noting, once again, how Jesus deliberately encountered this woman. Verses 3 and 4 says that Jesus left Judea and departed again for Galilee. And listen to verse 4. And he had to pass through Samaria. It was no accident that Jesus met this woman at the well. She didn't just happen to stumble upon Jesus. Little did she know she had a divine appointment with someone who would rock her world. Rock her world in a way that she never expected and in a way that she could never imagine. And I want someone here today to hear this. Know that you did not just happen upon Jesus. Know that you did not just stumble upon Jesus. You think that you just stumbled upon Jesus and that you were just lucky that you found Jesus. No, know that Jesus was looking for you. Know that Jesus came from heaven. Yes, he came to the world, but guess what? He came into the world for you individually and for me. He had divine appointments for each and every one of us in this room. God has orchestrated the affairs of our life so that we would be at the appointed place, at the appointed time that we would encounter the Savior of the world. Your encounter with Jesus is not by accident. The gospel is so beautiful in that Jesus came to the world, but he also came to us individually. Jesus had you in mind. He had your face in mind. He had your name in mind. And he left his heavenly glory, entered into the time when he was in eternity. He entered into matter when he was just spiritual. For you, for me, because he had a divine appointment on his calendar that said your name was on it. And I'm so glad that Jesus, he knows when to meet us. He knows how to speak to us. He knows how to get our attention. I'm so glad that he knew my name and he knew, he knew where to meet me. He knew where to find me. Jesus saw this woman knowing that her past was sketchy. Knowing that she was a part of this group of people that he was not supposed to associate with. Knowing that she was a woman and he was not supposed to speak to her. And yet with all of that, he still makes his way to the well because he had a divine appointment on his schedule with her name on it. This is a wonderful reminder to us that the Lord is near to us. Yeah, he met you right where he met you and it was a divine appointment. That's how much he cares for you. That's how much he loves you. The founders of every major religion said this. I'll show you how to find God. But Jesus says this. I am God who has come to find you. And so when we encounter Jesus, we need to know who it is that, it, that we are encountering. Because if we only knew the gift of God, if we only knew who it was, I believe it would change our response to Jesus. And it will drastically alter and change our life. You know, when you find Jesus, you always get more than what you expected.
when we encounter Jesus, it changes our response when we know this, that what he is offering and the gift of what he is offering, its substance is spiritual and not natural. What Jesus offers us, it is spiritual, it is not natural. Can you look with me at verses 7 through 10? You didn't close your Bibles, did you? There's one in the pew in front of you. If you'll open it up. Verses 7 through 10. Listen to what it says. A woman from Samaria came to draw water. Jesus said to her, give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, how is it that you, a Drew, Drew ask me for a drink? Ask for a drink from me and a woman of Samaria, for Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, if you only knew, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him for a drink and he would have given you living water. Jesus baits this woman into a conversation by asking her for that which is natural. He asked her for a drink. But then after he baits her in, he flips the script on her to reveal something spiritual to her. When he speaks of living water, he is not speaking of something natural. He has changed and he's using water as a metaphor. He's not speaking of something natural when he says, I have living water to give you. He is inferring to something spiritual. Yes, I know I'm Captain Obvious, but we need to remember that when Jesus offers us something, it is not something that is first natural. It is something that is first spiritual. Jesus knows this, that we do have natural thirst. But many of us are unaware that we have spiritual thirst that need to be quenched. And the thing that needs to be quenched before your natural thirst is your spiritual thirst. Because we are all meandering through this world looking for something to worship. And anytime we worship something that is natural, it is only for a fleeting moment. It does not last. When you had that last drink of water, I guarantee you, you're going to need another drink of water. Because anything that we go to naturally to quench our thirst will not last. Jesus offers us that which first is not natural, but is spiritual. Its nature, its substance is spiritual. And if we don't know or realize or remember that it's substance spiritual, we will miss what he's offering and what he gives. If we don't know and if we don't realize and if we don't remember that what Jesus is offering is not something that is natural but spiritual, we will often miss what it is that Jesus is trying to offer us because we will revert to those things that are natural When Jesus is trying to go to a higher level, and many times it goes over our head because we're stuck on the natural. Earlier this year, many of you know that the Avengers Endgame came out. No spoiler alert, don't worry. But I went to the movie, and when I knew that the movie was coming out, I was reading um, reviews of people who had seen it ahead of time, and they were talking about how great it was. But but, but I, I was coming across some stuff that was saying, like, you need to know these things before you go see the movie. And so um, I I am to movies like Minister Drew is to sports. And so (laughs) he is to uh, movies as I am to sports. So I had to ask him. I said, Minister Drew, and I um, I texted um, Dick and Ben. I said, y'all got to tell me, like, what am I supposed to look out for when I go see Endgame, Avengers Endgame? And so my friend was around my birthday time that it came out, one of my good friends. He paid for my ticket, and I picked. It's like a $25 ticket. And we went, and we were sitting back eating food served to us right there. And listen, I left the movie disappointed. Very disappointed. I came to Deacon Ben and Minister Drew. I said, why did y'all make me go see that movie? I could use those three hours. And can I get those three hours back in my life? And they said, see, the thing is, Pastor P, is that you did not understand that there were some other deeper meanings going on that you were missing on the surface. You were just looking for action when there is actually meaning behind the scenes. 
They said, in this scene, see, what you don't know is, is that he encountered such and such, and that was from this movie. And I'm like, I don't know any of that. And guess what? I missed the entire movie, the point of the entire movie, because I was just on the surface level. I was like, why is there not more action? That's how many of us are when we come to Jesus. We're looking for action. We're looking for things in the natural. And what God is trying to build to us is not natural. It is spiritual in nature. That's why the scripture says that we wrestle not against flesh and blood. Because it is not about the natural. What Jesus is offering us is spiritual and not natural in its substance and in its nature. How often do we, like this woman, miss the spiritual matters because we are so focused on the natural and carnal things of this world? We are so carnal-minded that we're not any spiritually good. I know we get on people who, and we say, to, we say people, uh, that person is so heavenly minded, but they're not any earthly good. Guess what? I would rather skew on being more heavenly minded than earthly minded because I don't want to miss the move of the spirit because I'm so stuck in my flesh. Because what Jesus was trying to offer this woman was not natural, it was spiritual. And I don't want it to go over your head like it did this woman. Jesus is offering us something that this world cannot give us. And if you focus on things of this world, you'll miss the moments, the encounters with Jesus that's supposed to be able to do exceedingly and abundantly above all you can think, imagine, You're thinking about brunch. You're thinking about vacation. You're thinking about going back to school. You're thinking about having a uh, parents thinking about having to buy clothes for their kids. For the listen, don't be so carnal minded that you miss what God is trying to say to you. This woman was about to miss Jesus because she was stuck on water, and he was talking about living water. I got to move on because I'm running out of time. Can I just give you this, just to give it to you some more from the text? Listen, she was stuck in natural customs. She says to her, how is that you, a Jew, ask me for a drink? I'm a woman of Samaria. She is stuck on the things in the natural. She goes on to say, listen, you have nothing to draw water with. The well is deep. Where are you going to get this from? She's saying, listen, this is a well that my father Jacob he, he, he dug, dug this well. She is stuck on the natural. And Jesus said, listen, what I'm offering you is not about what's in the natural. It is to quench your spiritual thirst. Let us, O oh, Heavenly Father, become more aware of your power. We cannot focus on things of this world must lift our eyes to things that are above. If you only knew what it was that Jesus had to offer, you wouldn't be so stuck on this world. But if we only knew the source of what Jesus had to offer was the Savior, then our response would be, di- would be different. The source of what Jesus has to offer Is the Savior. Listen to verses 11 through 14. The woman said to him, sir, you have nothing to draw water with. The well is deep. Where do you go to get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob? Yeah, he is. He gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did his sons and his livestock. Jesus said to her, everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But here it is. Whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. See, she was going to a well to try to get water. She's like, Jesus, if you think you got water to give me, you don't even have a pail in your hand to be able to draw water from the well to get this water. And Jesus is like, listen, 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 listen. You think you need a pail in order to get what I'm offering you. But the thing that you are looking for, I am he. I am the source 
of what it is that I am talking about. The Savior is the source. She thought she, he was referring to something that you could work to attain. And Jesus was saying, no, you got to drop your pail for this one. This is not something that you can work to attain. This is not something that you can work to get through your own natural means. This is something that I offer and I give to you because it is a gift. It is not something that you have to work for. And what Jesus was offering her was to drop her pail. To drop the things that she was going to in order to be satisfied. To drop everything and to find her emptiness filled in him. He would be the source to fill her emptiness. The Savior would be the source. There's a passage in Jeremiah chapter 2 that everyone, um, all the commentators understand, un lays underneath this passage. Jeremiah chapter 2 verse 13 says this. For my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me the fountain of living waters, and have hewed out cisterns for themselves, broken cisterns that cannot hold water. Many of you know I just got back from Israel, and one of the things that I had the privilege of doing was they just recently, in the last five years, they found the steps that the um, Jews, um, Israelites, would walk up from the pool of, um, of, of, of bathing where they would cleanse themselves all the way up to the temple. And they came across it five years ago. And, I mean, the, the steps are literally pristine. I mean, just beautiful going up the mountain. But underneath those steps, they built this trench. They built this basically sewer system so that when it rained, the water would just not flow down the steps, but that it would go underneath the steps like a sewer system would. But they, they, they let us walk through this thing. And don't worry, there's no more water in it today. It was just oh, it was back then. And so they let us walk through, and we got to a certain place where there was this hollowed-out place that had been dug out. And he told us that this was a cistern that was 2,000 years old. And see, what happened was, in that area, there aren't very many water sources. They, can't, they couldn't turn on the faucet, and water would come out. And so since they weren't sure that they would be able to get water, what they would do was they would dig out these large cisterns, in order that when it rained, the water would collect in the cistern and they would use that rainwater to drink and to bathe and to clean. But who wants to clean with rainwater? That's what a cistern is. It is what you build with your hand in order to get the thing that you need for life. And Jesus is referring to Jeremiah 2.13 when he says, I have living water. He's saying, and my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and they have hewed out cisterns for themselves, broken cisterns that can hold no water. Here it is, is that they would build their cistern, and then their cistern would begin to crack, and water would seep out. So it wouldn't even hold what they were hoping it would hold. That is what happens when we go to other things than Jesus for the source of life, for the source of happiness. Jesus is the source of what it is that he is offering to us. And we have to refuse going to the other things that we will create in the natural to try to please ourselves. Our emptiness can only be satisfied in Jesus. And many of us would rather Settle for a cheap alternative than experience what's true in Jesus Christ. We don't want to leave our cheap alternatives because they are working for us. There's something interesting that happens at the end of this passage. There's an inter interesting commentary that says that the woman left her pail and went into the city to tell other people about Jesus. Some of us need to leave the thing that we have been using for happiness in life and find it complete in Jesus. You're looking to have natural things met. And until we are satisfied in Jesus, ultimately nothing else will ever be truly satisfied. 
I'm going to say that again because it's so good. Until we are ultimately satisfied in Jesus, nothing else will ever be truly satisfying. But it is when we find our satisfaction in Jesus that we can truly begin to enjoy the things that he has graciously given us to enjoy. But when we go to the stuff before we go to Jesus, it will not satisfy. It will only be for a fleeting moment. And you will have to keep going back because it was never given in order for it to fully satisfy. This leads us to the third thing. If we only knew that the sustenance of what Jesus is offering is sustaining, it would change our response. Its sustenance is sustaining. What it gives, what it manufactures, what it what we get when we receive it, it is sustaining. Can I tell you how it is from the scripture? Look at verse number 14. But whoever, actually let's start at verse, yeah, verse number 14. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him, here it is, will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. What Jesus offers sustains you for the rest of your spiritual life. You will never be thirsty again for belonging and for meaning because you're in Jesus. But when you're outside of Jesus, you will search for meaning. And in fact, as Ecclesiastes tells us, everything in life will be meaningless because you don't have Jesus. But when Jesus comes into your life and he fills you and you have that sustaining sustenance in you, it reaches to eternal life. So many of us, we want this, but we don't want to drop our pail. So many of us crave this. So many of us are thirsty for this, but we don't want to drop our pail. If you will drop your pail, know that what we get in Jesus is satisfying. I know some of you are saying, yeah, it's satisfying, but I still have this natural desire. What do I do with this natural desire? When you come to Jesus, you get that satisfying sustenance initially, but your body will still want the cravings of this world. And in those moments, you have to know that what Jesus has given you is better than what the world can give you. That's when you have been satisfied in Jesus. Because you don't have to have what the world offers. Here's how Jesus puts it. Jesus says, when they, uh, the disciples come back and they say, aren't you hungry? He says, no, because I have food that is not of this world. I don't live by bread alone. And many of us think that we can't exist without having that. But if you exist without having Jesus, you're not living. You're merely existing. But if you really want to live, drop your pail. Lord, help us to drop our pails. To be ultimately satisfied in you. We all want this stuff, but guess what? We, like this woman, be stuck in the natural. Listen to what she says after Jesus offers her all this. The woman said to him, sir, give me this water so I will not have to be thirsty or have to come here to draw water. She's still stuck in the natural. She's still stuck on this natural stuff, even though Jesus is offering her something special. My prayer today is that we would not get stuck on the natural. 
Don't get stuck in the natural. Jesus is offering us something spiritual that will change our life for forever. He will give us something that will change our response to him. If you only knew, if we only knew, we would drop those pails and we would come running to him. So if there's someone here today who you have not uncovered this living water yet, drink from Jesus and be satisfied. Drink in what he offers and be satisfied. And to the one who is sitting in the room, perhaps you're like me. You feel parched. You feel thirsty in life. You feel a little thirsty. Know that there is a deep well reservoir of living water inside. If you have accepted Jesus, return to that well and drink from that well and be satisfied. In the same book, in John chapter 4, verse 37, it says, Jesus says, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture says, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Drink from Jesus and be satisfied. We started our time off talking about this man who they made this movie about. And the title of the movie is The Man Who Saved the World. And people didn't recognize him while he was living. He was dead for four months and nobody reported his death. But he saved the world. People were unresponsive to him. But do you know that there is another man who saved the world? For God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him will not perish, but will have everlasting eternal life. See, 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 when we think about this man who saved our souls from burning hell, that's cause enough to be satisfied in Jesus. Listen. Y'all can go ahead and gain the whole world and forfeit your soul. For as for me, I'm going to be satisfied in Jesus. Come to the well that never runs dry. He is a fountain of living water. How do I know he lives? Because he got up three days later out of the grave with all power in his hands. And if you only knew If you only knew, you wouldn't be sitting on your seat right now. If you only knew. If you only knew, you would be saying, no one can worship God for me. (laughs) You would be saying, for the rest of my days, here is my worship. For all the things that you have done, here is my worship. If you only knew. Some of y'all still stuck in the natural. You're still stuck in the natural. When you encounter Jesus, you can't just respond naturally. When you truly encounter Jesus, all of your being will cry out in worship to him to ascribe praise and glory and honor to the only true and living God. I encourage you to drink. Drink from Jesus. He offers you something that this world cannot give you and that this world cannot take away.